Hi, welcome to Ed Talks. I'm Dr. Janae Nugent. I am a member of the History Department here at the University of Lethbridge, as well as a Board of Governors Teaching Chair. I would like to begin the session by acknowledging that the University of Lethbridge rests on traditional Blackfoot lands. And in accordance with the university uh, policies and procedures, I would like to uh, start with a Blackfoot welcome, which is Oki Nitsu Kawawa, which means uh, welcome to our friends and neighbors. So welcome uh, today to our guest, Dr. Joy Morris from the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science. Did you say mathematics or math? I say math. You say math. Is it technically, it is technically mathematics? Mathematics. mathematics? I would like to start by saying congratulations on uh, recently winning this year uh, University of Lethbridge Student Union Teaching Excellence Award. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a, it's a great honor. This is an award that's uh, nominated by students and voted on by students and, um, and given by the Students' Union. So uh, it really is you know, sort of the People's Choice Award of <laughs> awards, and it's a great one to receive in particular. Thanks. It's, a, it's definitely an honor, and I'm thrilled to have been given it. And I think it was really thanks to some exceptional students, of whom we have many here at the University of Lethbridge. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about the students who nominated you and, and why they said they'd nominated you. I had a lovely group of students uh, who took, I usually take teach just two courses here at the university because I'm a half-time professor. Um, and these students, most of them took both of my courses over the course of two years and also worked with me in, um, in an external program that I run uh, through, with the school board here. And most of them are math education majors, so they want to become teachers themselves. And they felt that I very much connected with them on a personal level and encouraged them in where they want to go. And they were they felt inspired by my teaching, which was lovely to hear. Yeah, yeah. well, you put so much time and effort into putting together your classes. I certainly try to, but yeah. it's not always <laughs> obvious to the students when that happens. Yeah, exactly. Um, so were you there uh, at the actual awards ceremony? Yes, yeah. yes. There were five of them there, and they read their um, their what they'd written about me to nominate me, and it was very touching. Yeah, oh, that's great. It's a great moment. Um, that's the evening where they have the last lecture, right. and then the Students' Union uh, presents the uh, their teaching awards as well. Yes. So it's really a celebration of the students about teaching on campus. And, and in fact, just to show their dedication, two of my students were on their practicum semester in Calgary and had driven down that oh. day after teaching all day. They drove down to be there for the ceremony that evening and they were teaching again the next day. So they drove back that night after, oh, wow. <laughs> after doing that. Oh, that's really great. So you teach math and education students. Um, many of your students in your classes are, are double major. They're in math and they want to be teachers. Correct. Um, and so you're saying that they had worked with you on a community uh, engagement sort of project that you've been involved in, uh, which I really, really love this project. I think it's fantastic. And um, I know a lot of people in who have children in the school system in Lethbridge have certainly heard about uh, your project. Right. So um, a couple of years ago, I realized that there was a void that I could help fill in the in terms of what was available. Um, I'd been volunteering in my daughter's classroom. She was in grade six at the time. And I recognized that the kids who I was being asked to help were often struggling a lot more than what I could help them with in an hour's time a week, which was all I was in the class with them for. They really needed more preparation, more background, more intensive and ongoing connection with the topics that, that they were covering and the background, the basic background and numeracy skills that they needed um, in a way that really could only practically be provided by their parents or outside of the school just because of time constraints. And I was also hearing from other parents involved in the schools that they weren't feeling necessarily able to help their kids with their math, especially in high school, but even to an extent when, once they got into middle school, most parents sort of feel like they can handle the elementary school level math. <laughs> right, yeah. But once they get into middle school and certainly high school, they start feeling less and less competent or confident over the math skills themselves. And also the kids start developing more and more of an attitude and are more inclined to tell their parents that 
they don't know what they're doing. And so if the parents have any lack of confidence at all, <laughs> they're, they're going to feel like they don't know what they're doing. Right. So um, I suggested to the school district that I could run help sessions for parents to um, to tell them sort of what their kids are learning in middle school math, because a lot of parents, of course, just don't know what, what's in the curriculum, don't understand what it means, even if they took a look at the curriculum, and may wonder about how it's being taught currently as opposed to how they learned it, if there are differences, especially if their kid is telling them there are. Right. Those are all things that I could help inform the parents about, but I could also provide them with activities that they can do with their children on an ongoing basis, just around the house, in the community, while they're out shopping with their kids, um, that will improve those numeracy skills and help their kids succeed in math. What a great initiative, right? And, um, and I think that it was fairly well. Yeah, the school district was very enthusiastic and I got quite nervous actually initially because they, uh, want, I received, in, as a parent of a middle schooler, I received a phone call home from the school saying that these sessions were going to happen. There was information about it in the newsletter. It was going out in all kinds of ways, and I suddenly realized there could be, for all I knew, 2,000 parents <laughs> <laughs> could show up in the first session. <laughs> and I wasn't prepared to deal with that. <laughs> what sort of space did, did you use? Uh, we, for were, it? we were using a classroom in oh, one of the okay. local middle schools. Right. Good thing there wasn't 2,000 people. <laughs> yeah. So I went and I talked to um, the, one of the math education people here at the university, Rochelle Marinowski, and uh, got her assistant and went into her classroom of the students who were taking their second practicum semester and asked them if they would volunteer to help out with these sessions so they would have some more people floating around to help one-on-one -on -one with people who wanted a little extra help in these sessions. And yeah, we, we had about 40 people turn out the first day and it, it dwindled down to about 10 by the end after that. We, these are sort of six to eight weeks once a week drop-in sessions so people right. could come multiple times or not as they choose. They could bring their children or not. The only thing I said is I didn't want parents just dropping off their children and not oh. staying themselves right. yeah. <laughs> because that wasn't the point. Yeah, you weren't there to do math tutoring to the kids. You were right. to help the parents figure out yeah. their system. And that said, there were some parents who just wanted tutors for their kids really and didn't want to be involved themselves. and. Again, the math education students helped enormously there because they have, through the Education Undergraduate Society, they actually run a tutoring center, so they oh. put people in touch with tutors if that was what they wanted as well. Oh, right. I didn't realize that the yeah. Education Undergraduate Society did that, and that's really great. Um, so is that open to, like, is it tutors for? Tutors for anybody. Anybody. Yeah. Like, oh, very interesting. I didn't know that. That's a good little tidbit to know about. Uh, so the students helped you out and um, it's a great experience for them as well, right? To get that opportunity to work with parents and to work with kids and be involved in an initiative about how to um, solve an issue that's Yeah, really... it, was, it was pointed out to me that this actually fills a bit of a gap in the education program in that in many ways the, the students as they're studying education are actually protected somewhat from communications directly with parents. Oh. Um, because often when a parent is getting in touch with the school over an issue about their child, it's not a positive <laughs> communication. Right. And so the, the teacher, the supervising teacher is usually sort of standing in, in, in the middle there and, and taking responsibility over that. Um, and so it's rare actually for the practicum students to interact with parents at all. So um, this actually sort of fills a gap in their experience in that way. And I was also, uh, again, the, the local school district has been very en enthusiastic and supportive and the superintendent and the board chair have signed certificates of appreciation for the students yeah. who've participated in this. That's so great. They can put that in their portfolio and hopefully it will help in their job search. Yeah, definitely. And I love that it's, um, you know, from an educator's perspective, I love that they're getting the opportunity to think outside the box about how to you know, problem solve um, situations that might exist in, in their classroom or more broadly within the education system. So that's pretty cool to, yeah, to take just, a bit of a risk. 
taking a different look at how yeah. to how to solve some of the problems when you have a student in your class who isn't responding maybe the parent needs to be more involved and maybe there's there are ways to achieve that yeah and there might be reasons why the parents aren't able to help them so this is a way to absolutely yeah. and there may be reasons why parents aren't able to help them through this program either, of course. Right, yeah. But, uh, and, and we've experienced a bit of that. We've had this program running for two years now, and the first year there was significantly higher attendance than the second year. And that may be related to the fact that in the second year we ran it based out of a, a school in the north side of Lethbridge, which is at least traditionally considered to be a lower socioeconomic area of town and where more of the students come from families who may be working multiple jobs and just don't have the time or effort to put into assisting their kids with that. Yeah, time or energy to do that, hey? Exactly. Yeah, oh, what a great initiative. Um, so a lot of the time you have ed majors in your class, which must be, I mean, I, I have ed majors in my classes as well, <laughs> and, uh, and it pro they provide a really interesting dynamic to a classroom, right? Because they're um, often willing to do the sort of presentations and, um, they like to take charge of leadership sort of opportunities and that sort of a thing in the classroom. And so do you design some of your assignments around that in with that in mind or with the ed majors in mind? Definitely, I definitely I do. Um, there's, there are definitely things that come up in both of the classes that I teach regularly that, um, that would be very easy for students to teach their um, their own students about as they're learning. In fact, again, something that came up in my daughter's grade six class was uh, the idea of, of negative numbers had been had been introduced in grade six, and uh, the students were talking about negative numbers and what's the negative of this, what's the negative of that, and one student stuck up their hand and said, "Well, what's the negative of zero? Uh -huh. And and the teacher <laughs> said, "Well." I don't think there really is a negative of zero. I, I was horrified. <laughs> um, because um, the, way, the way we define negatives technically in mathematics, and definitions are very important in mathematics because you really need to understand exactly, very precisely what you're talking about right. if you're going to arrive at any proofs or definitive truths as we right, yeah. like to in math. And the way we define a negative is something that when added together with the thing you started with gets you to zero. Oh. Um, where zero, again, has its own definition as being the thing you can add to anything and not change the thing you started with. Right. So if you look at the negative of something as being the thing you need to add to it to get zero, then it's very clear that zero has a negative, which is zero itself. That you have to add to zero to get zero is zero. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and because in my abstract algebra course, we're actually introducing these concepts of, of additive inverses, as we call them, and so on, I'm able to give that example to my students and say, if they ever are teaching in a class <laughs> and they try and tell a student that there is no inverse of zero, additive inverse of zero, I will come back and haunt them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that sticks with them. <laughs> 20 years from now, they won't make that mistake again. <laughs> I know that when you uh, are setting up your classroom classes, you often try to uh, have an applied component or sort of a, that is both fun, but also applicable to the, to the world outside of the, the theoretical math. Yeah, so I, I try to get in, in the smaller class that I teach, I try to get the students to work on projects that um, I wouldn't say they're necessarily applied, but they, again, especially for the education majors, they give them ideas of topics that they might not otherwise have thought of that are actually things that are surprisingly simple that could be introduced at an elementary or middle school or high school level but aren't just because of the way our curriculum is structured. Right. Um, puzzles and games and, and logic ide ideas that are really actually surprisingly easy to understand, but um, 
and and many people do them for fun, <laughs> right? But don't think of them as being math necessarily, right? Um, so one of my courses is more involves a lot more of of those kinds of puzzles and games and so on. And so I have the students work on a project outside of class time where they are studying some of these in more depth, and they have to they have to write up a math paper, which is a very new experience for most of them. They, have mostly written essays and projects of various sorts in their more social studies and humanities sort of classes. But a math paper, they really don't know what it should look like even. Right. Yeah. Um, so Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because uh, standards for what is plagiarism and so on are quite different in math as well. Oh, um, interesting. But yeah, so there's a lot, there's a, lo a bit of a learning curve there that may or may not actually be of any use to them after my math class, but, <laughs> right. but they also present this to the class and I ask them to do a practice presentation for me before they present it to the class and then part of their grade is based on how they actually use the feedback that I give them and mm -hmm. make changes to their presentation before they give it to the class. Ah, very good. They, um, that makes me think about the plagiarism. So I, every once in a while, um, students will reference in a style where I'm like, what is this? And then they'll say, <laughs> oh, that's math. And it's a totally different <laughs> referencing style. So it's interesting because our students come in and with our liberal education philosophy, they have to take classes in sciences, social sciences, and uh, humanities and fine arts, right? And so we all have our different ways of doing things. And the poor students, it feels like we're forcing them into, you know, learning all these different methods. And they're like, why do I have to know right. so many different methods of, of citation or right. whatever? But it's important because First off, can you can you learn different systems, right? <laughs> can, can you see why each of the different disciplinary perspectives and the way in which they sort of think about things use different referencing formats? Because it makes sense, right, mm -hmm. um, for particular disciplinary uh, ways. But it's it really um, sort of forces them to think through those those different approaches. And yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of it, the issues with math are that again, are are language has to be so precisely defined in so many ways in order to be very explicit about what we mean so that you can write down a proof and anybody else anywhere in the world for whom English is a first language or not can read that proof and be, con be absolutely convinced by it. Right. You have to be very precise in your language if you're going to do that. And that means very often there isn't a lot of flexibility in how you define a term, for example. And so it's not considered plagiarism if you lift a definition word for word from somebody else without writing as a quote. You should still cite the source, right. but you don't have to actually call it a quotation. Right, <laughs> yeah, oh, that's interesting. It is a, yeah, and I mean, I think it's important for us to realize as faculty when we've, especially in the lower level classes where they're getting those um, general education requirements, right, that, mm -hmm. that those students are coming from totally different perspectives. So. Yeah, that's that's totally fascinating. Um, so, what are some of the applied? Do you have any examples about some of the assignments or or um, puzzles that you might use in a class? Sure. So, um, so one of the one of the little games that I that one of my students did a project on last year that another student later told me she had been using in in one of her classes in her practicum to oh. with with a kid. Is, uh, is the game of uh, searching and, and sweeping on graphs. So if you think of a graph, not your traditional, I'm going to graph a function, but what, what I call a graph for the purposes of, of this particular course and what many mathematicians, one, one, one of our definitions of graph is a model of a network. So you've got a bunch of points and a bunch of lines connecting them. The points might represent cities or they might represent telephones or they might represent computers, anything that might that can be connected. They might represent people and then the lines might represent friendships or the lines might represent the roads or the uh, wires connecting the computers. So if you abstract a network to just those ideas of you've got some nodes and some connections between those nodes, then this particular game is um, okay, there is now a robber 
somewhere in this network and they're trying to escape from cops on this network and <laughs> right. so you've got two players one player is playing the robber and the other player is playing the cops so you're they're... teaching them to be criminals <laughs> <laughs> or the cops <laughs> or the cops okay. <laughs> and uh, so the the robber player is trying to see if there's a way that they can forever stay away from being captured by the cops uh, interesting. and the cops are trying to um, corner the robber somewhere right uh. and there are different versions of it where people know where the robber is to start with or don't know where the robber is where the robber knows where the cops are or doesn't know where the cops are the number of cops can be different the particular network you're playing on of course can change the amount you can the distance you can move in any move can be diff can vary so very all, all kinds of different versions of right. this game and there are then results on what what types of networks do the cops always win on or this kind of thing right so you can sort of chart patterns and yeah yeah well, that's interesting and so what age group was your student using that uh, it was elementary with? school yeah, I'm not elementary. sure what grade exactly it was but right. yeah it was uh, because all, all she had to do was draw a bunch of dots and lines and say, okay, you're the cop or you're the robber. <laughs> can you catch me? <laughs> or, right. or can I catch you? Can you stay away from me? Right. Yes. And so again, it's, it's very simple to implement and explain. Um, but there's also a lot of interesting and deep mathematical theory behind right. it. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. so interesting because it just shows that applicability of math and how we're doing math in so many different ways without even realizing it in our lives. And and instead of being daunted by, I don't know how to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Again, some of the some of the sorts of activities that I encourage parents to do with their kids to to strengthen their math skills um, are, for example, recipes is a is a wonderful one for fraction skills, oh, yeah. especially and conversion skills if they're especially if you're if you're doing measurements in Imperial, <laughs> you've got a, a quarter cup of something and you need to quadruple the recipe. Well, okay, that one's easy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but uh, many, yeah. many of these conversions can be quite a lot more interesting. If you've got a teaspoon of something and you want to multiply the recipe by eight, well, how many? How much of a cup is that? Right. <laughs> Can you estimate that? Yeah. Oh, that's great. And um, yeah, and especially for the ed majors, it gives them a lot of um, tools to work with when they go out into the classroom. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and another one we did was just converting money, and calculating tips, and ta calculating tax. So those are all real basic numeracy skills that we use every day in real life counting out change, figuring out how much change you should have. Again, very basic numeracy skills that we all use every day in real life that we sometimes don't involve our kids in as much as might help them, especially in these days of plastic, right? Yeah. You don't even give your kids cash anymore typically, so they have no idea what to do with <laughs> it often when they have it. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I often I often stump store clerks by, you know, if something is you know, a dollar 25 and then I might give them you know whatever so that I get back a solid amount of you know like one coin yes. rather than a whole bunch of coins and then they're always like why are you doing this I, <laughs> so yeah that, that often happens and I had an even worse experience with a store clerk once where I'd I'd given her you know twenty dollars and twenty five cents or something for yeah. something that cost five dollars and twenty five cents right. and she was convinced that that meant she should give me 25 cents less change instead <laughs> right. of 25 cents more change than yeah. she would otherwise give me. And I had to argue with her that me giving her more money did not mean she should give me less change back. Yeah, yeah, we just don't use that sort of um, numeracy in our daily lives as much because we don't use the cash. Yeah, you just it's stick really your plastic card in. And yeah, and away you go. It's all done. So. Oh, Another outreach project that I know you're involved in was out in uh, Brockett recently. So, and this is totally um, interesting and fascinating outreach. And I know it was a, um, an experience that was uh, very um, different than what you thought it was going to be going into it. So. Yeah, I, I definitely went into this experience. So this was teaching a, an outreach class for um, 
people in Brockett from the uh, from the Pikani First Nation, the the nation wants to encourage. Well, they're having trouble finding teachers who want to teach in their schools at all, but they also more specifically um, are having trouble finding math and science teachers because many of the First Nations students, unfortunately, for whatever reasons, who go to university don't end up in the maths or sciences. Also, they are finding that they're actually losing the Pikani dialect of Blackfoot to a large extent, mm -hmm. so they would like to train some teachers who can teach in Pikani, in, in that dialect, um, in their schools. Um, so for those twofold reasons, they're trying to encourage some students to go back to school to become trained in education, right. and then hopefully return and teach in Brockett, ideally, right. <laughs> as far as they're concerned. Right. And so I was asked to teach the math class to upgrade their math skills to the point where they could become a math or science major by at least being ready to take our first year math classes. Um, and I went into it, as you say, with <laughs> expectations that were quite different from the reality from a number of perspectives. To be very honest, I went into it with a bit of white savior complex, which is obviously unrealistic. Um, I also, though, from all sides, uh, I think there was some misunderstanding of the level of preparation that the students had and the level of preparation that was required for the particular course that they had asked to be delivered. Right. And um, the students who had been enrolled in this program just did not have the background to be ready for a pre-calculus course, which is what they'd asked for, essentially. This course is intended for students who have recently taken a grade 12 course, but not, um, not the one that we require for pre-calculus, so not right. Math 12.1 in the Alberta system. Right. Um, or have taken Math 12.1, but not in, the last, not in the last year or two. Right. So they've forgotten a bit of it and want, some, want a bit of reminders or catch-ups. This was not where these students were at. Many of them hadn't taken Math 12-1 at all. Some of them hadn't taken any Math 12 classes. Um, those who had taken Math 12 classes of any level, it had been at least five or 10 years for the most part. Mm -hmm. and there were a few exceptions, but um, they just weren't ready for the class that they'd asked for, and, and it would have been setting them up to fail, which wasn't in anybody's best interests right. if I continued with the course that they were asked for. Yeah. Um, it didn't help that because it was out in Brockett, it was being offered as a 12-week, three hours, a three-hour block on Saturday mornings, right. um, which is never the easiest way to learn math. It's much better <laughs> to get it in little bits and pieces so right. you have some chance to work through your your homework and yeah. understand the concepts before you get the next lesson. <laughs> right. But so practically it makes sense because people who are working can have that block of time on the weekends to Absolutely. Try and to of course for me it made sense because mm -hmm. I, if I'm gonna be driving an hour there and an hour back, yeah. then <laughs> we don't want to be doing that three times a week. Yeah. If we can do it once a week. Right. Um, and they did have the the grade the high school math teacher from Brockett was able to act as a TA for the class. Oh, that's great. So he was there and ran a couple of tutorials during the week, so it wasn't quite as just once a week. Ah, that's good. Big block yeah. as, as it could have been. But it was still very challenging. And we ended up re redesigning the course and also um, changing what it was called. So it ended up being the First Nations Transitions 520 course instead of the Math 500 course that it had begun to be, right. which um, is a math credit, but it's not a math credit that prepares them for first year math all in one go. It w should ho hopefully prepare them if they want to now take 500 Math 500, they should be ready right. to do that. Yeah, so still on the path, but. yeah. Yeah, well, that's good and shows your sort of nimbleness and uh, of, of yourself and of, um, of the organizers of the, mm -hmm. the course as well to 
meet the learner's needs and uh, make it something that's applicable and, and useful. So. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a big learning experience on both ends, I right. think, to, to just go through that process and discover what we needed to be doing that wasn't necessarily what we'd expected, but right. what would work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that brings up, there's a lot of um, research and talk about Indigenous ways of knowing, and um, and you and I were talking about this earlier, about uh, how there's a gap in that research after elementary school. Yeah, for for math and science, definitely. Right. Yes. Maybe, maybe I'm not sure as sure about science, but very much for math. I contacted right. all kinds of people whose specialty is Indigenous learning in math, and there are materials that are specific to indigenous learning for elementary school and to a lesser extent some for middle school, but there's basically nothing past middle school um, that is focused on indigenous learning. There are some obviously texts that have been used in uh, First Nations University in Regina and so on, but they're really just the standard texts and not not focused on indigenous ways of learning or knowing at all. Right. So, so yeah, so I struggled with trying to find what would be a good text to use from that perspective or good resources to use from that perspective. And um, because I had, I mentioned to you earlier, had taken this massive open online course on reconciliation through education out of University of British Columbia, that I, I understood that a lot, uh, well, a big need to address when looking for resources is just, well, to, to deal with storytelling sorts of issues, to be not just introducing math concepts without a reason, without a background, without a story behind it. And so I focused on trying to find resources that explained why we were doing things yeah. a little better and were actually more readable rather than just very dry and, okay, here's the next concept and I'm not going to motivate it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and that seems really interesting because that, I mean, that seems like that's applicable and would be useful beyond Indigenous Definitely. Uh, scholarship, right? Like it's that, you know, all of our students could stand to know, okay, why are we doing this? Why is this important? Where does it come from? How does it fit into my life? Um, that sort of thing, which I think that you're doing with your puzzling course. Yeah, like, definitely. I think, I think we find that, at least in math, and I can speak much better from <laughs> math, about math. <laughs> well, sure, yeah. That's, that my, that's my expertise. Um, that as students progress in levels, we tend to remove more and more of that motivation and storytelling component. And there are reasons for that. I think part of it is that as you get deeper into it, hopefully you already ha have internalized some of the motivation and, and storytelling and we can just get into the nuts and bolts. Right. Um, part of it are, is always gonna be time limitation issues of can we just get to the point here? Right. Yeah, content, <laughs> um, always content. How much, we need to get through this content. Definitely. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, very much it's important to, the, the storytelling is, is a big part of actually what I think I try to do in all of my classes, including before I, <laughs> I learned more about indigenous ways of knowing. Right. That um, those, those are the, when I introduce more stories and more personal anecdotes, that's always what I enjoyed in my in my professor's lectures. Right. <laughs> and and those are the classes definitely that I get the most positive feedback back from students. Yeah, it's something that you remember and can hang on to. Can you tell me about um, some of your favorite professors or inspirations for um, teaching and for pursuing math as a profession? Sure. So I had I had two really what I consider excellent professors as an undergraduate. I was at Trent and um, one of them was not somebody who inspired me as much, but I really felt that he taught fabulously to uh, the wide range of learners. Okay. So 
yeah, as I say, he didn't he didn't inspire me in terms of really speaking to where I, where I needed to hear necessarily, but I was incredibly impressed by how broadly he managed to actually teach people and get them through difficult courses that, that they were struggling with. And um, so all of my friends who were having some troubles and difficulties in math thought he was the best teacher ever. And <laughs> right. he did win a 3M teaching award and I wrote some letters for him to, to achieve that because he was definitely has been an inspiration for my teaching and I've tried to take some of the examples of what I saw in him and use that in my teaching. Right. But the teacher who I personally found more inspiring was one who uh, I, I took a couple of courses from in my first and second year and not thereafter because he went on a two-year sabbatical and wasn't around for my third and fourth year. But I, I, So I ended up actually taking a fourth year class from him when I was in second year. Um, and there were two or three of us in that class. And what I really was impressed by with him more than anything was his patience and willingness to wait. So he would ask, he would throw out a question and he would wait for, uh, for one of us to break. <laughs> that was so hard to do. And to answer it. <laughs> yeah. and, and I never understood how he could wait so long. Because <laughs> I would, we gotta, we've got to get move on. We've got to move on to the next con- Just tell me the answer. And I didn't want to throw out my answer and get it wrong. But I always ended up doing it because I broke more easily than the other guy <laughs> was usually there. And sometimes I was right and sometimes I was wrong and it was never, it was always okay Yeah. whether I was right or wrong. It was always okay and there was always a lesson to be learned from whatever answer I came up with, yeah. however stupid it ended up seeming. <laughs> well, it's a starting in point retrospect. for the conversation and to work on why yes or why no, right? Yes. So that's a great teaching technique. I remember when I was uh, when I first started teaching as a graduate student um, that my advice from one of the senior grad students who had been teaching for a while was, "Listen to the lights hum. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful sound. <laughs> you to listen to it for a while before jumping in and answering for the students because you really want them to. Um, it's an active and engaged sort of technique, right? To get them really thinking about, uh, you know, well, where am I? Who, you know, how can I answer this? And then. If somebody else answers, oh, I wouldn't have answered that way or would have answered that way. Like, it just gets them engaged in that thinking process rather than passively. Yeah, yeah. and I've found it a lot harder to implement in larger classes for math. I think maybe it's different in, in the humanities, humanities and social yeah. sciences. <laughs> but um, in math, yeah, people are really worried about <laughs> being wrong. And very often they're are right and wrong answers right and, yeah and you may or may not be able to get very much out of a wrong answer and as much as you may try to encourage someone who's given a wrong answer it's never going to be a right answer <laughs> right. there's always a no you didn't get that right <laughs> aspect to it so. yeah so so there are some challenges with it that i think in in math particularly because right. because math can be very absolute Right. There is right and there is wrong. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> um, but, but I think it's still very valuable, and particularly in smaller classes. You need to have them not just be copying down their notes and not thinking about what it means. You were talking about uh, resources just a little bit ago, uh, and I know that you've struggled with some of your classes for resources, so you went out and wrote your own textbooks. That's right, yeah. <laughs> What um, what was that experience like? It was challenging. So I, I certainly would prefer to use, I would love it if there were just textbooks out there that I liked, that, right. um, that I were happy to use all the time. One of one of my big concerns for a long time, um, I was I was active in the Canadian Federation of Students as an undergraduate, yeah. um, well, as a, as a graduate student, actually. So the cost of education has been a real concern to me for a long time. And the one 
real impact that I can have on that as an educator is by looking at the costs of the textbooks and the resources that I'm assigning my students. Um, so that's definitely a factor that I try to consider when I'm choosing textbooks is how much does this cost? And for one of my classes in particular, there really isn't a good textbook out there that is a, what I consider a reasonable price. The textbooks, m most of the textbooks out there don't cover exactly the topics that we cover in this particular course. And the ones that do are you know, $200, $300, which is not something that I'm going to ask my students to pay for one semester class that they may not then look in the textbook again, for right. all I know. Um, so I, I'm definitely trying to keep that in mind whenever I, whenever I look for, for texts. And in the absence of anything else, I thought, well, <laughs> I'd better write my own. And, I, and again, there, there, was, there was a text that did have the right material and wasn't too expensive, but it was really geared more at a, at a low-level graduate student rather than a third-year undergraduate student, which is what our course is at. So very dry, expecting some background, a lot of background knowledge, very uh, terse in explanations and expecting people to be able to work through that, all of the details themselves without a lot of help, right. which um, is not something that we should be necessarily expecting of third year student anyway. Yeah. Um, so I wrote my own yeah, book that, and I released it as an open access textbook. So it is available from the Open Textbook Library at the University of Minnesota and um, the open, BC Open Access Text Resources. Right, and so it's free for students to download. and It's free for students to download or for professors to download. They can also adapt it. They can they they have access to the source code so they can if they don't like the way I've done some of the explanations they can change those and yeah make those modifications and just acknowledge the source of the rest of the material oh that's cool that's open access is an interesting concept and it's really gaining momentum um, lately isn't it yeah for I mean I think for cost reasons, but as I'm listening to you talk about it, also for pedagogical reasons. Definitely. There are sound yeah. pedag pedagogical reasons for doing it. It's very important to have a textbook that really works well with your teaching style, that complements it, that doesn't just duplicate everything you're going to say in, in class, right. but also that, um, that provides some things that you're not providing, that that your lectures will actually enhance as well. It works all together, they're together very well. And I didn't realize that um, if you download a, an open access text that you can then adapt it to your own classes. So you don't necessarily have to start from scratch. Right, right? yeah, there so are, there are different, resources. different licenses that various open uh, access okay. texts come from. So there are some where, where literally all you can do is download the PDF and you can't actually modify it. But right. me most of them, many of them, come with Creative Commons licenses is the one I've used. But there are some other similar licenses where usually the ones that are available through these open textbooks libraries, usually you can um, ask for the source code, and then you can modify it as to suit yourself right. and your own preferences. So if there, also, if, you know, if there's some topics that you're not going to be covering, then why not cut those chapters out? and and uh, make it that much cheaper for the student to print. Right. How did you go about doing this? Like, did you know about open access? Did you do research? Did the teaching center, was that part, did they help you through some of that? I know that they're working towards using some, um, uh, doing open access and supporting open access. Yeah, uh, the teaching center and... certainly has resources and support. I didn't actually use any of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that's pretty new, maybe from when yeah. you started. Um, yeah. My husband started the, the first one that I worked on, right. the first text that I worked on. And so I used a lot of his code from that to do the second one. Yeah. One advantage that we have in math is um, Donald Knuth uh, 
designed, who was a mathematician, didn't like the typesetting systems that were available a long time ago, and so designed a system called LaTeX, which is sort of the standard now scientific typesetting format. And it's fairly simple to access, and it pr produces really good typeset material oh. um, from text code that's fairly easy to learn. So it's it's a system that we teach all of our graduate students and many of our undergraduate students as they're going through training. And um, it, it makes it quite easy to produce both our articles for journals, but also books right. for this oh. sort of purpose. Interesting. That's something I'd never considered before as typeset, but that makes sense because you're doing all your proofs and equations. And, yeah, I mean, it was yeah. really important in, in the tabbing, early days because... Tabbing, 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 tabbing isn't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> the equation formatting in Word, for example, it used to be absolutely <laughs> terrible. And now right. many word processors actually allow you to use LaTeX typesetting to typeset uh, uh, formulas as well. Right. Or, 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 and their own, their own typesetting of equations and formulas has improved dramatically right. over the years. But they used to really be pretty terrible. <laughs> so do students in your classes um, use that then to do their assignments or do they do things by hand? They usually don't use it okay. for assignments. Um, right. in, yeah, I, I have had one or two students who've done that, but I don't try to teach them that for assignments. But right. in the course where I actually ask them to actually write a math paper and do a project, I do. I recommend it. I don't require it, but right. I recommend it, and I provide some support for them if mm. they want to learn it. And mm. certainly any students who work with us on research projects learn LaTeX. Right. Oh, very interesting. Did, um, so, have, so you write the textbook. Um, it's open access. And then you teach the course again the next time around. And I mean, most of us are constantly evolving our classes. Are you evolving the textbook as you go along then as Definitely. well? Definitely. Yeah. So I mean, the first time I wrote it, I didn't release it publicly. I didn't, you know, I wanted to test run it a <laughs> few right. times before I actually was, a, was willing to put it out in the public domain. Right. Um, so the first couple of times I put it on a, a website that only students in my course could access. And I asked them for feedback and suggestions, and I made revisions based on that. And one of the big things that I hadn't done uh, before I, and that I needed to do before I released it publicly, and that I just did last year on the, on the main one that I've done, was just go through all of the exercises and make sure that they all had good solutions right. <laughs> and, uh, and actually write up solutions for those. And I haven't released all of the solutions publicly, but. But I released, you know, the odd numbered ones or things like that publicly and then right. kept back a handful, well, more than a handful, about half of them. But at least I have typeset solutions for those so they know that they're they're definitely doable and Right. So why not release all of them? So that they can be examined on or uh, yeah, so that I can okay. assign them for homework and without ah. Expecting that my students will just go and <laughs> find the Google answer. The yeah, answer. Yeah, okay, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, so, so the third year class that uh, you designed the textbook for, that uh, is very much your area of research expertise. Yes. Um, so my research area is graph theory specifically. So again, if you think of graphs as being these designs of networks, the, the abstract designs of networks. So it's a bunch of points and a bunch of lines connecting them. And I liked to tell my friends and family when I was in graduate school that I got to got, get paid for playing connect the dots. Oh, right. <laughs> um, but, uh, but what I'm actually studying then is symmetries of these networks. Mm -hmm. So what I like to, the, the example that I like to give is if you're going to connect five computers, say, in, in a network, one way you might do it is by connecting them all in a cycle. And you can imagine drawing just a pentagon with your computers at the corners of that pentagon. Oh, right. And that's one way of connecting them in a cycle. But you could also do it in a pentagram, a star. Right? Oh, right. And those are the same network. And they both have some nice symmetry. You could rotate either one, and you still get the same picture of the network. Right. But uh, one of the interesting things about it is when you have lines crossing each other, as you do in the pentagram, 
uh, which you don't in the Pentagon, that can create costs. So if you were going to etch that network onto a computer chip, for example, and those lines are crossing each other, but you don't actually want a connection there where the lines cross each other, then you have to create extra, an extra layer for that chip. You have to provide some insulation so that those wires aren't actually crossing. interfering with each other. Right. There are better and worse ways to design a network, um, even if it's the same network, to etch it onto a computer chip, say. Right. Um, and, and some of that can be studied based on the symmetries that the network has. That's, that's what I study. Oh, wow. Very interesting. In your program, do you use uh, students for research assistance at all? Yeah, we um, NSERC, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, which is where all of our science research funding comes from. It's certainly in math. Some <laughs> health sciences have some other options, but right. in math, that's our big source of funding. Strongly encourages the training of, of undergraduates and graduate students in research. Uh, it's a major component of what gets you grant funds or doesn't right. get you grant funds if right. you don't have it. Yeah, um, so, they call them HQPs, yes, right? Yes, high. HQP, highly qualified personnel. Right. <laughs> so, um, right lingo. <laughs> so they strongly encourage us to do that and uh, it's definitely an opportunity that we try to offer our students. It can be more or less challenging because Unlike many of the lab sciences where it's not too hard to get a student with relatively little background to do some fairly straightforward process in a lab for a semester and actually achieve something by doing that. Right. In math research, they need quite a bit of background before they're actually going to be able to prove something useful that right. other people haven't already proven. <laughs> right, right. Um, so my students, in order, to, in order to work with me, they usually have to be at least through third year. And so will these be math ed majors or usually just straight math majors or a combination of them? It just depends <laughs> who's interested and, and available and right. uh, who I've seen and worked with, usually I'll, I'll approach one or two students who have done really well in some of my classes and say, are you interested in doing some research? Right. And uh, do you use the Chinook research, uh, summer research program as well? We can. I yeah. haven't ever used it. Okay. But, but yeah, we do have access to that. I've used the NSERC uh, summer undergraduate research program, and I've also just sometimes hired students out of my grant directly, um, right. especially if it wasn't summer or was a shorter term thing where I just wanted to hire them for 100 hours or something during right. a semester. Yeah, because the programs through the university that provide funding for students to be able to do some of the research assistantships um, have those requirements, right, about a minimum of how many of our hours and not, can't think of the exact number right off the top of my head. But Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's, it's often easier for me, to be honest, to, to have a student during a semester. Right. They're there for, 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 for one thing. Many of our students, of course, as I'm sure you know, don't actually live in Lethbridge and like to go home for the summer. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So in the semesters, they're actually here. Um, so they're often not from Lethbridge, so they like to go home for the summer. Right. But also, con summer is conference season, and it's pretty hard to supervise an undergraduate student who does need a fair bit of oversight and and um, advice and help if you're traveling for half the semester. <laughs> yeah, when well, you're off to go. And so where have you been this summer? I've been to Slovenia and Mexico and Brandon, Manitoba. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a range of things. All for different conferences. All for different conferences, yeah. Right. All right. Is it very common for... Um, students uh, to be presenting at your conferences? It's quite common, yeah. 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 Are they usually graduate students or? M certainly far more graduate students than undergraduate students, but um, especially like, the, the conference in Brandon this year is a regional conference in my area. So they right. certainly would, if, if I had an undergraduate student, I would encourage them to go and do a presentation there. Right, if it was in that area, mm -hmm. okay. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I think uh, that was a very interesting conversation. Again, congratulations on your award. That's a great honor coming from the students. Thanks, Janae.